stage. So if you came for that little show, uh, you missed it yesterday. And uh, my name is Daramo. I'm from Columbus, Ohio, also known as Brent Houston. And I'm a member of a security group called the Wolf Pack, from Area Code 614. And I'm going to talk today about system profiling. And I want to talk about how you can take a network or a target, analyze it, and create a much finer method of attack. And if you're a system administrator, why this should interest you is I want to explain today how a real attacker targets you and some of those things that you can look for to know before it actually happens, as well as some of the steps that you can take to prevent network mapping and those types of attacks. So as we start to talk about this stuff, we're going to start out by talking about target location, some of the basic things of how you pick and find information about your target. Of course, we'll cover the general port scanning because uh, well, we're, that's a part of the process. System examination, we're going to talk a little bit about planning the attack. And we'll talk about touching base on some of the serious issues you need to think about if you're going to do some of these things. And then we'll talk again about how to protect yourself against these types of profiling and attacking. And we'll do a question and answer at the end. So a couple of things to start off with, uh, just generally to help uh, you decide whether you want to stay and see this or go see something else. Uh, we are not going to cover how to exploit a host or a network. So if you came here for that, you're probably not going to get what you're looking for. We are going to give you an introduction to the basic and intermediate network mapping and system profiling. And you're going to hear a little bit about, uh, from granted my biased point of view, why that's a very important and indeed a very sexy part of learning about networking. And hopefully, we're going to give you the skills to explore the wide networks that are on the internet. Let's. Uh, See a show of hands here if you have a 50,000 node network at home that you can play with freely. Not too many folks, but there are plenty of them available to you on the internet. And there's a great and fantastic way that you can learn about them without actually exploiting anyone, pissing anyone off, or making it a little harder for your system administrators. The first question I always get is, what is system profiling? And I guess two things about system profiling mean something to me. First of all, this is not just randomly picking up the latest Woo FTP buffer overflow and scanning every system on your subnet to see which one has it. What we're looking for here is a process by which we can actually learn something about a foreign network, a remote network, one that we don't have access to and we cannot see. Question number two that I get quite often is, why exactly do people do this? Well, the first and hopefully most obvious one, if you're a system administrator, is all the myriad of reasons that makes you a target, why you have risk in your organization. If you're a publicly traded company, maybe it's to manipulate stock prices. Maybe they're learning to attack. But more often than not, these network mapping exercises and the things that you're going to see are simply exploration. And they are what I want you folks to learn today is that this is a great way to go out and learn about networking and to get a close-up view of what a myriad of conditions and configurations look like. So I guess the last question I get quite frequently is uh, what is it that we're looking for when we do system and network profiling? And I can't stress enough, the number one goal is to build an intimate knowledge of the network layout. This, uh, this is the whole point, and I don't... On now? No. How about now? Yeah. yeah. There we go. Yeah, I think it's dead. Unfortunately, now I get to sit down. So to build an intimate knowledge of the network layout is the primary goal. 
And following that, it is to analyze the security posture and the potential for vulnerability. Because if I'm an attacker, I want to have a very direct and targeted method of attacking the networks that I'm looking for information on. I don't want to throw everything in the kitchen sink at it in hopes of gaining some root exploit to get the information. That's how people get caught. It's very sloppy. So building this information ahead of time will allow you to target your attacks and to do it more stealthily. And then lastly, I want to learn about the caveats that may create either an opportunity or a reason why I shouldn't attack this network. For example, if there are some links here to information uh, that might be a confidential or uh, maybe a classified nature, or maybe there are some indirect links to a gov or a mill net, I want to know that ahead of time before I accidentally exploit something that sends this sound to my door. Okay. So how do we go about looking up our target? And obviously, the first thing is doing a simple NS lookup command. Hopefully, you have some concept of who it is that you're looking to profile. For example, xyz.com or some other company. And just a simple NS lookup will reveal to you some of the basic IPs that they're using. Take that information, you feed it through an Aaron and who is lookup, and begin to create profiles of the different network addresses and network spaces that these folks are utilizing and that they own. If they're a public company, a simple Edgar search will reveal to you an amazing amount of information about the folks who actually make decisions there. And if I were an attacker attacking a financial company, this is a fantastic way for me to learn about the specific accounts and systems that I want to target. Basic web searches. Uh, I can't even begin to tell you the amount of times that I found hidden websites or internets, or excuse me, intranet sites that were listed in search engines that were inadvertently advertised and placed out on the internet. Uh, you'd be amazed when you can just do a simple search, find their inter intranet, and download all of uh, the names and addresses of the people who work there. Uh, pretty interesting information. Also, profiling their network users via searches of Deja and things like that to establish a profile from the folks who use Usenet and mailing lists. Obviously, if they continually post to things about Windows, such as the Windows support news groups, you know they might have NT servers inside. If they're posting to various other applications, you can begin to profile some of the applications that may be in use and transfer that into some of the vulnerabilities that may exist. One of the most fantastic ways to find out and target your company is to simply read their want ads that they post. If they're looking for network administrators that are proficient in Cisco and Bay, do you think they have a bunch of 3Com switches hanging out? Of course not, okay? Start to think like your victim. We continually tell security people they need to think like hackers, but we never tell hackers they need to think like victims. And you need to begin to do that. So you take that information that you've built from your profiling and you start to create a simple and basic network map. You provide the list of their access providers. Are they using redundancy? Do they have more than one main internet provider that's feeding information into their network? Do a simple errand and search. Look across multiple ranges. Find out, are they hiding some IP addresses? Where are their DNS servers? Add those into your actual physical map. Get out a piece of paper or a whiteboard and actually draw this stuff up. You'll be amazed at what you can discover when you see it visually. Look at their public access systems, web, mail, FTP, those various systems. And if they're public, explore them. Uh, we're talking about basic, simple things here like looking at anonymous FTP that's open to the public. You'll be amazed at some of the information that you can find there. If you're really concerned about things at this point, as you should be, if I were a true attacker, I'd be using proxies to do that or using throwaway hosts. Now that you have your basic network map of where their basic web and public servers are, as well, their, as, well as their DNS, you want to look for the not-so-public hosts and servers. 
So sometimes a simple ping of various servers will uh, reveal to you changes in their ping times that may indicate either alternate routes or system, uh, systems like proxies where the ping, the ICMP time varies due to the traversal of the proxy. So you can begin to analyze what types of defenses they have just by sending simple ICMP traffic. Trace routes to all the various hosts you have and start to add those hosts into your network map. Are there alternate routes between specific servers? Can you establish the relationship between servers to determine whether they have a single DMZ or a multiple DMZ? Or hopefully if you're a system administrator, your worst nightmare that they just simply route straight into your private internal network. So you take that pathing information and you actually create a physical map about their perimeter. The next step that I suggest that you take is doing a simple DNS zone transfer. Uh, this works about 75% of the time and you can accomplish this by again using your familiar tool NSLOOKUP. Simply type NSLOOKUP, do a set type equals A, put in server equals, or excuse me, on some system it's server space that targets DNS and then a simple LS space minus D target.com and make sure that you follow that up with a trailing dot. And what this is going to do is it will dump out all of the IP addresses and all of the system names that are registered for public use. Now, a lot of folks will find that their primary DNS is the one that you admins are controlling have this locked down, but about another 70% of the time, the secondary or tertiary DNS is not so configured and will gladly give up the information that you have uh, tried to secure yourself. So I urge you to uh, take a look at that. Next step would be to perform simple things like ping sweeps using either Nmap or any of the other myriad of products in either OS and find the hosts that maybe they didn't intend for you to find. Maybe they have some uh, hosts that are sitting out there providing VPN or SSH access, telnet access into, uh, into their perimeter. And for those of you folks, I, I guess I'll stop for just a second, who are trying like mad to write stuff down, this presentation will be available on my website at the, at the end. I'll give you the URL so you can come back and get this stuff. And the following thing after the ping sweep uh, that we see most everybody seems to perform is using advanced host location tricks. And this is doing things like Nmap back scanning or sending multitudes of various ICMP types to elicit responses from hosts that may have either host-based protection or may be protected by a firewall that is restricting the types of traffic it can uh, respond to. I guess I want to take a, mo a moment and talk about port scanning techniques. And the first thing is, we ask, we get asked continually why systems on the internet are, are port scanned. And I want folks as attackers to start to realize that it is simply a beginning to identify what system processes are in use. And I say it's a beginning because things are not always as they appear. Uh, I can't count the number of times that I've set up some other service on port 80 and I watch people continually throw HTTP exploits against them even though there's not even an HTTP server running there. Um, so I w that's why I want you guys to understand that it is simply a beginning to that process. And to perform port scanning, there are a myriad of tools, or if you really want a good challenge, take a lot, LibNet and write your own. That would be kind of fun. It's a good exercise. And if you uh, still don't have many ideas about how to accomplish this, just a simple man space Nmap will uh, cough up all kinds of ideas. So to perform the actual port scan, you can and should always use a throwaway host, and that may simply be enough. Some hosts are not configured to resist or to log any uh, port scanning attempts, and you may be able to simply accomplish your goal with a throwaway host. The other thing that a throwaway host can tell you is if you port scan once and you get X set of results and you port scan again from that same host and you get a different set of, of results, 
you may find that they have adaptive defenses in place, in which case it's much better to find that from a throwaway host than from your real attack host, as you may then be blocked out of their network or added to some of their other defensive measures. And the key point here is that when you start looking at some of these clever things that you can do with NMAP, is remember that it may be bypass a firewall or an IDS, but that as a network administrator, it also raises the bar. I don't really care if folks just send simple port scans to my network, but I guarantee I'm going to be a lot more concerned if I start seeing some tricky things like fragmented packets or act scanning. And I'm going to take some more steps to make sure that you don't continue to do that. And I want to remind everyone that slow and low, and that means targeted scanning, is always a good bet. And I get the question next of, well, what exactly do you mean by slow and low scanning? I mean use a throwaway host just in case, but also target the scans. You want to make sure that you're not scanning for every single port in the 65,000 plus ports that uh, are available. Only scan for the few that you're looking for, plus a few decoys to throw off any tricky admins. And make sure you vary the timing if you're going to slow the scan down and don't use the standards. If you just do a standard uh, paranoia scan, for example, many IDSs now are smart enough and have those patterns of timing set into them to realize that that is still an NMAP scan. So vary the timing yourself. And remember that slower is always better. The more time that it takes you to map a host or a network, the more likely you are to slip past the attention of any IDS or below any threshold that uh, a system administrator or network administrator might notice. So at this point, you should have a table of information that shows various hosts that you scanned. And you can begin to explore those hosts because, as I said, things may not always be as they seem. So simple banner, excuse me, simple banner grabbing using either Telnet or Netcat or some of the other specialized clients will reveal systems that are running specific applications and often the versions of that application they're running. You, if you've run Nmap or Queso or some of the other tools, you also now have a basic identification of the operating system. You can begin to build tables and cases of, an of anomalies. For example, if you have one host that appears to be running three different services that runs on three different operating systems, you probably have a port forwarding device. And you can begin to uh, create a process of profiling those types of hosts. And at this point, I'd like to touch on SNMP. Uh, I can't count the number of times in the some thousands of networks that I've mapped in the last 10 years that SNMP has given up very valuable information and allowed me to profile a network very quickly. Uh, simply scanning for common strings and using tools like SolarWinds or SNMP Walk has uh, really made this process very easy. And oftentimes, you can create complete profiles of systems and devices that are on the network with these tools. Now that we have an understanding of what systems are available, what their operating systems are, and what they're doing, the next step in actually attacking or learning about this network is to do user enumeration. And in Windows NT and some Windows, other Windows systems, this is very easy. Uh, you can often do it through null sessions. You can use uh, specific mail hosts using the expand and verify commands and uh, finger. Common system names and naming conventions are another way of actually starting to do uh, excuse me, user enumeration. Uh, for example, if you notice that folks have named all of their users, first initial last name is a naming convention, it's not too hard to start to guess some of the basic and common combinations. Starting to look at public file shares, maybe mount up some of the anonymous shares that are available on their network. This is very, very common. Uh, it's so common, in fact, that it actually made the SANS top 10 list. Then uh, performing things like browsing the registry and system settings, and there are many tools to do this, Dumpackle included. And after Jennifer Granick's speech yesterday, I uh, added this little thing that to note that not only do many of these processes raise the bar for administrators 
to see that you're mapping their network, but uh, now as Jennifer said that some of these things may actually be illegal, such as mounting uh, other folks' C drives and D drives. So at this point, you should have a general map of the target network's perimeter, and you should uh, understand what their defenses are. Do they have a firewall? By now, you probably know what kind of firewall they have and what types of IDS systems they might be utilizing to protect against attacks. And hopefully, by this time, you've started to gain a bonding and an understanding with this network, what types of systems they use, what their backbone capacity looks like. So I guess the next step is probably the one that everyone says is very boring, but I kind of think it's a little sexy. Uh, and you're actually going to learn some stuff if you take the very next step. So uh, this is what we all started for. And really, at this point, is where script kitties get left behind. Uh, they are more interested in targeting uh, excuse me, systems of opportunity rather than specific hosts. So this is really the next step. And the next step also gives you some knowledge. And as everyone uh, knows, knowledge equals power. And you can take these skills and use them to make money legitimately. So if you want to move into the profession of being a security consultant, uh, this is a very good step to take. And this simple process is actually sitting down and creating a vulnerability matrix. So you take the systems that you have profiled, the applications that they're running, and you use the publicly known vulnerability databases to learn about what exploits they might potentially be vulnerable to. And I don't mean just simply create a map that says, there's a buffer overflow in this version. Actually learn about why it works. Look at the exploit code look at some of the advisories that have been issued so that you begin to understand how the attack actually functions. Once you've researched each uh, of the vulnerabilities that are available, you can actually uh, begin to create a map by priority and the things that uh, you might gain out of it, as well as to find what risk is involved. Is it a high noise attack or is it a low noise attack? Uh, is it something subtle that you can get away with? Or if it fails, is it going to denial a service uh, a server? So at this point, I get the major question of, now what do we do? We have this information. And I guess I return at this point the responsibility to you. You can either analyze the data, learn from it, and move on to the next network. Or you can choose to attack systems if you so desire. And my uh, point here is that I want you to take from this speech that you can learn from these systems at the point to, you, to which you would perform those exploits. But at this point, you can move on and learn more about another network. And there's some reasons why you should do that. Uh, first of all, the minimum risk is that these attacks and these actions that you've created will be a violation of your ISP's terms of service, and they will disconnect you, and you'll have to choose another ISP. Not a big deal in today's market, but still uh, an issue possibly nonetheless. This also could be a violation of the law. Some other things here that you need to know is these things that we've talked about, trace routing and uh, mapping networks, do not do them to .gov or .mil sites. Those folks tend to take it a lot uh, more seriously than your average .com. And if you mount some of their shares, they probably will come looking for you. Beware of honeypots. If you see some things that are too good to be true, they probably are. And they're probably uh, waiting for someone like you to stumble into them. But the key point is here, remember that if you are going to build a succession of profiles, that stupidity does exist. And it gives you a great chance to look at network X versus network Y. Kind of a cute story at this point. Uh, I have some folks of my friends here who are system and security administrators. And a couple of them have actually used this technique to look at networks before they went to work there. And they could judge what their profit and uh, job opportunities might be by mapping these networks. So uh, I'm not suggesting you set up an insecure network, by the way, as a recruiting tool. But uh, that's always a possibility in today's job market. So if I'm a system administrator, what would I got to do to protect myself against profiling? First of all, I want to not let attackers get this information. 
We continually, as we do audits around the country, we hear that network mapping is uh, not a risk to you. And I'm here to tell you that as system administrators, what other people know about you can hurt you. And you need to start to take network mapping very seriously. So the first step is, of course, blocking ICMP at the routers or at the borders of your network, using things like implicit deny rules on your firewalls. Use smart naming conventions. Folks, don't name your firewall, firewall.whatever.com. Uh, it just makes it incredibly easy to do these types of attacks. Uh, routers should be named something other than router one, router two. Okay? Uh, at least make it fun for us. Uh, that's what I'm asking. Uh, restrict zone transfers, and if you've already done that, go back to your service providers and make sure they've done it as well. Don't just call them and ask them, but audit that process. Uh, I've seen highly secure networks that the, ter the tertiary DNS had both internal and external addresses for the target. Uh, that will hurt you every time. The other uh, SNMP related function here is never use public or common community strings. I should never be able to get read or write access to your routers with a public community string via SNMP. And uh, this continual, excuse me, happens continually over and over again. Also, take steps to disable user enumeration by restricting access to the expand and verify commands in SendMail, restricting the use of finger, uh, removing the ability for NetBIOS traffic to pass into your network. Begin to educate your users. The folks that post to Usenet, uh, ask them to do so from addresses other than your .com address. Maybe uh, teach those folks how to sign up for Yahoo or some of these other free mail services and use email to news gateways because this is becoming a very easy way of profiling some of these companies that are out here. And if you're a Fortune 500 company and you think that folks are not posting information to the world about you, you're dead wrong, I'm here to tell you. It happens continually and it becomes very easy to make you a target. Begin to provide proxy access to public services to protect against things like browser-based attacks or hostile code. And apply the registry keys to disable remote access. This is a good idea not just for external hosts, but for internal hosts as well. There's probably no reason why users should be able to dump out registry access from their own systems or others around them. Obviously, disable that bias at the border, I covered that. Remove fingerprint information from banners. If someone can tell that to your uh, FTP site or FTP, excuse me, if they can FTP to your FTP site and find out what version of Woo that you're running by looking at the banner, uh, you're just making yourself even more of a target. Don't give away this information. While uh, these folks say don't depend on security through obscurity, that is correct, but you certainly uh, should take that away as a tool. And remember that, uh, excuse me, remember that security through obscurity is always ineffective. There are methods to uh, get around that every single time. And I urge you folks uh, as system administrators to deploy IDS technology and honeypots. And that's my presentation. I'll uh, take questions. Uh, the, presenta excuse me, the presentation and the abstract will be available at wolfpack.dynip.com. We've got that on some stickers, and we've got that on business cards. So uh, if you have any questions, you can also email me. Again, I'm Daramo, and I'd be happy to take your questions at this time. Uh, the question is, what are some of the good ways to try to detect if you found a honeypot? Uh, again, if things are too good to be true or, or uh, appear to be too good to be true, they just may be. One of the classic examples I like to throw out of this is a host of, that I audited recently had a, a supposed net bus infection. Okay? The name of the system was firewall.whatever.com. Okay? Obviously, folks are going to protect their firewall a little bit better than to have Netbus running on it. Um, so some of the really common uh, stupidity type exploits, if you see many of those or even a few of them on a host, it may be a honeypot. Look for things like variances in the operating systems and the banner information that you gather. Does that answer your question? In the back in the hat? 
Point. Uh, the gentleman's point is that sometimes blocking ICMP at the borders will break other things. For example, uh, wow, excuse me, a little bit of a headache. Uh, IPsec, VPN connectivity. And uh, my, my thing here is it's a level of mitigation risk. Can you accept this for that? Uh, if you're using IPsec, this may not be an option for you, so you take other steps to mitigate that risk. Perhaps, by example, uh, we have one client who does this very similar situation. So what they did was they forced all of their road warrior folks that are traveling out there to use one ISP for their road trips. And then they added that range specifically into the firewall so that those folks could pass their required traffic but the rest of the internet could not. Yes, sir. Well, I'm on the ICMP. It's just be very granular on it. The problem he's talking about specifically is allowing a subtype of ICMP unreachable call packet to get mm -hmm. If you allow that to the deny the rest, you can still defeat a lot of force getting A second big point on that is close to your outbound traffic as well. Correct. This, uh, this gentleman down here points out that he has a fix for you, sir, for your uh, ICMP issue. So you two should probably meet afterwards and talk about that. But that if you allow uh, certain types of ICMP and are very granular on your access controls, that you can fix that, uh, that IPsec issue. As well, he points out that as system administrators, you should be setting up egress rules for your firewalls and systems. And uh, I certainly agree with that. It was a little bit beyond the scope of this talk, but certainly you should be doing so. Back there in the back. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. The, the question is, is there tools to automate uh, drawing maps from trace routes? Absolutely. Uh, there are a couple of good products in uh, the Linux environment. Uh, one of them is slipping do you know thumbing off the top of your head that uh, it draws that, that great network map? Keops, yes, uh, for Linux. And there are a couple of good ones for, uh, for NT as well, although their names are slipping my, uh, my mind at this point. Visual route, yes. Is there, his question is, is there a way to keep SNMP tools like SNMP Walk and SolarWinds from working on your system? There are two ways. First of all, you can restrict SNMP requests to hosts that uh, you want to allow SNMP access from. You can also change your community strings to something other than the common ones. If you come up with an inventive one, they won't be able to dump your information unless they know it. Other questions, comments, concerns? Okay, I have a t-shirt to give away. Uh, and I've got uh, the folks at Phoenix uh, that make the Phoenix Firewall from Progressive Systems. And they donated a t-shirt that I'm supposed to give away to you guys. So <laughs> I'm going to ask a good trivia question. I spoke at DEF CON last year and Black Hat. Does anybody here know, for the t-shirt, what I talked about? Yes. <laughs> Good call. Anyone else? That's absolutely correct. Appliance Firewall Review. So here's your t-shirt. You can come up here and get it. What's your name, sir? <laughs> Fed. <laughs> 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 Congratulations. Folks, uh, is the next speaker here yet? Okay. Yes, sir. Can you tell us your report about the Firewall? 
Wow, I wish I had a penny for every person that asked me this. Uh, the last year's report on the appliance firewalls did not get posted. Uh, we began to do so and were litigated against, and our lawyers never worked it out. So we did not post. It seems that when uh, specific appliance firewall creators send their product to you for evaluation that you are not allowed to publicize the results of that evaluation without their express written consent in advance. <laughs> yeah, I wish I could say that, uh, but my attorney tells me that I shouldn't talk too much more about that, so I apologize. I think it's <laughs> It might start with an N. <laughs> no, uh, there are some great appliance firewalls out there, and in actuality, if you have been watching the firewall market, some of those products have matured to a fantastic point. Uh, there are some great ones, like, uh, for example, the Phoenix uh, firewall that I just gave the t-shirt away for. Those folks um, have become a larger company now, and uh, they've done a great a great job with it, as have uh, some of the other folks like WatchGuard. And if you've looked at any of the new revisions of the Cisco picks, which I recommended last year, these Cisco folks have been busy and have actually fixed uh, about 90% of the issues that I pointed out. So those folks deserve some attention as well. Okay, that's it. Next, uh, next presentation. Thanks for coming out today.